Hello, and welcome to UK Employment Law, the View from Mayor Brown podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners, which highlights recent case law and legal developments of importance to UK employers. It is presented by members of Mayor Brown's employment team and occasionally features special guest speakers who are involved in changes in employment law. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your continuing education requirements. And at the end of the podcast, we will explain how to get in touch if you wish to claim credit for continuing education purposes, or if you have any comments or questions. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Chris Fisher, and I'm the head of the London Employment Team here at Mayor Brown. This week, we've got two Court of Appeal cases from the middle of January for you. The first one is about the powers an employment tribunal has to order disclosure against a party who's not based in Great Britain. And the second one deals with when the tribunal will extend time for a claimant who misses the deadline to submit a discrimination claim. So the first case is the case of Sarnoff versus YZ. And the background facts are quite interesting. Uh, The claimant was employed by the Weinstein Group of companies, which includes the US company of which uh, Harvey Weinstein was previously co-president. That's the Weinstein Company. The claimant says that she suffered sexual harassment by Mr. Weinstein and is bringing an Equality Act claim against the Weinstein Company, which is a US company, and its US parent, Weinstein Company Holdings. She has also sued Mr. Weinstein himself and various other board members of the US parent company. The claim against the board members is that they knowingly helped Mr. Weinstein's harassment by not taking steps to prevent it, and so they are said to be liable under Section 112 of the Equality Act. One of the US board members is Tim Sarnoff, and he's a US citizen who lives and works entirely in California. It's worth pointing out that the board members deny that the tribunal has jurisdiction for this claim, uh, but there doesn't appear to be a preliminary hearing that's been ordered on this point, and so that issue will be decided when the main claim comes on for a hearing. So this decision isn't the decision in the main claim, but it's an appeal by Mr Sarnoff against the tribunal's order that he should disclose documents in the proceedings. As is normal, because he's a respondent to the claim, he's subject to the tribunal's usual case management orders, which in this case include an order for disclosure by all of the parties. And Mr Sarnoff argues that since he's in the USA, the tribunal has no jurisdiction to make a disclosure order against him. He was unsuccessful on this point in the tribunal and the EAT, and now the point has reached the Court of Appeal, which is this decision. So in order to understand the case, I'm afraid we need to take a quick look at a couple of the Employment Tribunal Rules of Procedure, which are from the 2013 rules. Um, But fortunately, there are only two that are relevant. The first one is Rule 29, which is the general case management power the tribunal has. And it says this, the tribunal may at any stage of the proceedings on its own initiative or on an application make a case management order. And as to what's meant by a case management order, the rule says that this means an order or decision of any kind in relation to the conduct of the proceedings. So, a very broad general case management power um, in Rule 29. Following on from Rule 29, there are a series of specific case management powers in Rules 30 through to 40. The specific one we're interested in here is the disclosure rule, which is Rule 31. And that says... The tribunal may order any person in Great Britain to disclose documents or information to a party by providing copies or otherwise. So you can see the key reference there in Rule 31, which doesn't appear in Rule 29, is the reference to an order being made against any person in Great Britain. And that was the basis for Mr Sarnoff's argument. He said, well, the tribunal's power to make an order for disclosure comes only from Rule 31, not Rule 29. And so Rule 31 says it can only be made against a person who is in Great Britain. And he said, well, that can't apply to me. I live in California and I've never been at any relevant time in Great Britain for the purposes of this claim. And the claimant argued in response to that 
that the, the disclosure power in Rule 31 only applies to disclosure orders against non-parties, so people or entities who are not a party to the litigation. Um, and the claimant said that the power to make orders for disclosure against a party derives from the general case management power in Rule 29, and that isn't limited to parties who are in Great Britain. It extends to parties who are outside Great Britain. Well, to cut a long story short, the Court of Appeal agreed with the claimant. They said that Rule 31 is concerned only with disclosure against non-parties, and so it's irrelevant as far as Mr Sarnoff is concerned because he is a party to the litigation. The power to make orders in relation to a party to litigation comes from Rule 29, not Rule 31, and so it doesn't matter if a party is inside or outside Great Britain. So at first blush, I think the case does appear to be quite a far-reaching one, obliging an individual who has at all times lived and worked on the west coast of America to give disclosure of documents in a British discrimination claim. And you might think, well, claimants are certainly going to be encouraged to take advantage of this interpretation of the tribunal's powers by joining individual directors or indeed employees who are based outside of Great Britain uh, onto discrimination claims, where, of course, as we know, individuals can be sued and joined as parties personally. And that may well be the case, but it's worth remembering that before doing that, a claimant will need to have a legitimate basis for joining a party who is outside of Great Britain to a claim in the first place. And in, in the case here, as I mentioned, the individual board members are challenging the tribunal's jurisdiction to hear the claims against them. And that decision, when it comes through, I think will be a very interesting one. So, that's Sana versus YZ. My second case, um, as I said, is another Court of Appeal decision from middle of January. Adadeji versus University Hospital Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. And this is a case about a claimant applying for an extension of time for a discrimination claim that he wanted to submit late. And so it looks at the test under the Equality Act, which is whether it is just and equitable for an extension to be granted. Now, this is a fairly common situation, and so it's rare for an issue like this to go all the way up to the Court of Appeal. And so when it does, I think it's worth having a look at why. And the facts are slightly unusual. Mr. Adedeji was a surgeon with the Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. He resigned from his employment, which ended on the 24th of August 2017 and he was claiming constructive unfair dismissal and race discrimination based on events that had predated his resignation. So the primary three-month time limit for him to present his unfair dismissal and discriminatory dismissal claims was three months from his termination date, i.e. three months from the 24th of August coming to the 24th of November 2017. But he put his tribunal claim in on the 27th of November, so he was three days late. So why was that? Well, the main reason he missed his time limit is that he misunderstood the ACAS early conciliation rules. And I think we might all have some sympathy with him there. Um, the ACAS early conciliation rules are the rules, as we all now know, um, that require claimants now to contact ACAS before they can put in a tribunal claim with a view potentially to carrying out conciliation through ACAS to try and settle the claim and avoid proceedings. And where that process takes place after the time limit for submitting the claim has begun to run, the clock is paused while the conciliation takes place and so the claimant enjoys an extension of time effectively. One peculiar feature of the ACAS process is that although the claimant has to contact ACAS, they don't have to enter into conciliation if they don't want to. In cases like that, ACAS will simply issue the early conciliation certificate and the claimant can then pursue their claim in the tribunal. Now what happened in this case is that Mr Adadeji contacted ACAS shortly before he resigned in May 2017. He notified them about the dispute he was having with the trust and his potential constructive dismissal claim. Now, it seems he wanted to name a representative from the British Medical Association 
in the ACASH process, but the BMA told him that they couldn't act in that capacity for him. And so Mr. Adedeji immediately contacted ACAS to withdraw the early conciliation notification, or at least that's what he thought he was doing. But in fact, ACAS simply issued an early conciliation certificate on the basis that, as far as they were concerned, the conciliation process had been completed. Now, in his mind, Mr. Adedeji thought the conciliation hadn't taken place because it hadn't. There had been no conciliation. And so he said he proceeded on the understanding that when he was ready to, he would resubmit his ACAS conciliation notification. So time moved forward. Mr. Adedeji resigned later on in May and his employment ended on the 24th of August. He thought, therefore, he had up until the 24th of November to approach ACAS to start the early conciliation process. And by doing that, he would benefit from the automatic extension of time, which the early conciliation rules provide. Now, pausing there, this was a mistake by Mr. Adedeji. In fact, the early conciliation in relation to his dispute had already taken place, as I say, and because it had been concluded before the three-month time limit ever began to run um, on his claim, there was no extension to the normal three-month time limit. So the last day on which he was going to be able to submit his claim was always the 24th of November. Now, if Mr Adedeji's only mistake had been to misunderstand the early conciliation rules and the impact on time limits, I think the court might have had a bit more sympathy for him and possibly granted him his extension. But there were two key points against him um, that the court found particularly relevant. Uh, the first one was the fact that Mr Adedeji waited until the very last minute before thinking about putting in his tribunal claim. Um, he said that the reason for this was that he was waiting for a decision from the General Medical Council about the dispute he was in, and he hoped that that might resolve things. Um, but whatever the reason, it, it seems he waited until the 16th of November, so about a week before the, the time limit was due to run out, before he contacted anyone. And he contacted a firm of solicitors with a view to them acting for him in the claim. Now, the court was pretty critical of him for waiting that long and leaving things to the last minute. But then came the second point against Mr. Adejaji. When he did take that advice from the firm of solicitors, uh, they told him that he wasn't going to be able to benefit from any extension of time and that his last day for submitting the claim was going to be on the 24th of November. But Mr. Adejaji didn't accept that advice. He thought it was wrong. Uh, he couldn't accept that there had been any attempt at conciliation of his claim and so he thought he still had another chance at contacting ACAS and starting the conciliation process. So he did begin to put his claim together um, and he put in a further notification to ACAS on the day before the deadline, so on the 23rd of November. And he then put his claim in, but he put his claim in on the 27th of November. And by then, he was three days late. So... Based on those facts, the court looked at the test for extensions of time under the Equality Act, which, as I said before, is whether it's just and equitable to extend time. And in this case, um, the Court of Appeal, at least, looked in particular at two things. They looked at the length of the delay and the reasons for the delay. So as regards the length of the delay, this was probably Mr Adedeji's best argument because the delay was only three days but the Court of Appeal said that although the formal delay in terms of the time limit was a short one because being a constructive dismissal claim the key date was the last day of his employment the underlying facts leading up to his constructive dismissal related to events that dated back into late 2016 which was about a year before the claim should have been submitted and so what the court said was that it is open to a tribunal when it's exercising its discretion on extensions of time like this to take account of the fact that although a formal delay might be quite short, sometimes the consequences of granting an extension of time will be to open up issues that have to be examined that are quite stale because they happened a long time ago. And that, they said, can weigh in the balance when considering whether to extend time. 
As for the reasons for the delay, as I say, this is really where I think Mr. Adjadeji fell down. Um, the court said that it was understandable that he hadn't appreciated the way in which the ACAS early conciliation rules worked. He thought he'd withdrawn his notification back in May and that conciliation had never taken place. But he left it until the last minute to turn his mind to presenting the tribunal claim. And so the court said he had to bear the consequences of that. And then when he had received very clear legal advice that he had to get his claim in by the 24th of November, he had chosen to ignore that advice. So in the end, no extension was granted. And while, as I say, there are many extension of time applications made in the tribunals from time to time by claimants who miss time limits, what's interesting here to me is the way in which the court looked at what constitutes a short delay. Um, the assumption in this case, I think, might have been to think, well, it's an application for a three-day extension. The claimant's probably going to succeed on that. But as the court said, the impact of agreeing the extension here was going to be to open up historic facts that the court was then going to have to examine that dated back over a year. Um, and that's often the case with tribunal claims, particularly discrimination ones, where a claimant will often plead acts of discrimination going back over a lengthy period of time. So I think this is a case to bear in mind for employers who might be looking to resist applications for extensions in similar circumstances in the future. So that's the case of Adedeji and University Hospitals Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. And that brings me to the end of the podcast. I hope you found it useful. And as always, please contact us with any questions or comments. And until next time, I hope you stay safe and healthy and I'll see you next time. Bye for now. So that concludes this podcast. We hope that you find it and others in the series helpful. If you have any comments or questions or want to know how to claim continuing education credits, please email Christopher Fisher, Head of Mayor Brown's London Employment Team at cfisher at mayorbrown.com. Thank you for listening to the podcast.